Okay, so thank you very much, Bernard, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to um, this beautiful event. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to give this first talk, and um, I will try to make it to use the obstacle problem as a, um, let's say, motivating example where we want to study, um, let's say, regularity of some object, in this case, will be free boundary, and in particular, how genericity tools allow us to get better results than what you should you will get in a let's say deterministic setting so let me try to first set up the problem so the classical obstacle problem start from the following situation so let's say that i have a curve in r3 for instance and uh, this curve you can think of it as a metal wire so i will represent my curve as a graph so I have my bottom domain here. This is my omega. And I represent this curve over omega as the graph. So this is the graph of some function f. So f is a function from the boundary of omega into r. And its graph represents this metal wire. And to this metal wire, I want to, to attach some, um, some elastic membrane. So my elastic membrane is a surface here. So this is an elastic membrane. Membrane. And uh, uh, this my elastic membrane is represented by a function. Again, it's a graph. So I have function u from omega into r. And what is U is the uh, configuration energy of an elastic membrane, which is attached to my metal wire, and it minimizes some energy. So what is the energy that we are considering? So U is the minimizer of the following energy, uh, let's say minimum of the integral over functions V, let's say, of grad v square over two over omega uh, with the constraint with the constraint that v is equal to f on the boundary of omega. So this would be like basic linear elasticity. So the Dirichlet energy is uh, the linearization for the um, more complex model in nonlinear elasticity. When you just linearize linear elasticity, you just get elastic energy, which is uh, the energy of the graph. So here I'm simplifying my, my life because I'm assuming that my membrane is a graph. OK, now um, if you want to be, let's say, in a more um, realistic situation, you say, OK, but uh, if I have an elastic membrane attached to a wire, there, is, there are forces acting. In particular, I should, the first thing I should consider is that I should add gravity. So my elastic membrane will be subject to gravity. So if I add gravity to the picture, then instead of minimizing the energy that I just wrote, I should add potential energy. So I will have grad V squared over two for the elastic energy. And then I will add G times V, again, with the, this uh, boundary constraint that I'm touching the wire. So here, G is just a positive constant. So G is the gravitational constant. And uh, without loss of generality, I, we can assume that G is identically one up to normalizations. OK, so so far, so good. Uh, what can you say about the minimizers of this problem, in particular, the second one? So if U is a minimizer, then uh, what do I know? I know that for every phi, let's say, it's infinity and compactly supported in omega, uh, the energy of U, um, so plus, sorry, uh, plus uh, U, remember G equal one, will be less or equal than the inter over omega of the energy of U plus epsilon phi, because this is a competitor, plus U plus epsilon phi. And uh, this condition is true for every epsilon. So this implies that uh, the derivative with respect to epsilon 
at epsilon equal zero of the energy should be zero. And from this, you deduce that the integral of grad u times grad phi um, plus you have a plus one uh, over omega is equal to zero. Sorry, plus phi um, is equal to zero for every phi, which is infinity and compactly supported. And now this term, you can integrate by parts. So this is minus Laplace and u times phi plus phi. And so uh, if you have this relation for every function, you deduce that the Laplace and u is identically one. So this is the, the stationarity condition for the for the, our minimization problem. Actually, this is a convex problem. So you are a minimizer if and only if you satisfy this PD. And from this, you can deduce that u is smooth, it's infinity, or even analytic, in fact. So this is a very easy problem. Now let's add an obstacle. So I added gravity. That was my first, uh, let's say, element that I added to the problem. And now the next step is let's add an obstacle. Add an obstacle. What is an obstacle? So here, let me try to draw the picture again. Let's say I have my wire. I have gravity acting, pushing down. And now I'm going to assume that there is some obstacle lying um, below the, the, my wire. And I will draw it in, a, in already in the final situation. So I'm going to assume, for instance, that the plane xn plus 1 equals 0. So this is my uh, xn plus 1 coordinate. So, we are in, so the base is a ren, and then I have an extra coordinate, which is the height, right? So this was my em plus 1 axis. And then the plane xn plus 1 equals 0 acts as an obstacle. And let me just remark more general obstacles um, can be considered. So here I will. For simplicity, I will assume that my obstacle is just a plane, but you could take like a smooth, for instance, a surface, and everything I say can be generalized to this setting. So I have my membrane, I have my obstacle, and then what happens? My elastic membrane uh, that I'm considering, well, I will use it like this. So it bends down due to gravity, right? So my elastic membrane now is not uh, flat anymore, but it tends to bend down to the gravity. But now, because the plane acts as an, as an obstacle, the membrane cannot cross the plane. So there will be some region here where u is identically zero, OK? So the membrane bends down, is pushed down by gravity. If there is no obstacle, it can go down as much as needed. But then if there is an obstacle and you know the metal wire is sufficiently uh, low, then this obstacle will play a role because my elastic membrane will not be able to cross my, the plane below it, and it will touch somewhere. And this is the obstacle problem. OK? So here is the difference. You are minimizing the integral of grad v square over 2 plus v over omega, so elastic energy plus potential energy. But you have the constraint that uh, on the boundary you are equal to an f, but also that v should be non-negative now. So v cannot cross the obstacle, which is x n plus 1 equals 0. Okay? And uh, this is a nice convex variational problem. There is existence and uniqueness of minimizers, then no problem. So um, you exist. And now the question is, what can you say about you? So again, you need to, so um, one can compute the optimality conditions it's not totally straightforward i should say okay so here there is some work to be done before it was very easy to prove that uh, laplacian should be equal to one here you need to work a bit to write the optimality conditions but the, the idea here if you look at this picture 
let me go up. So the idea is the following. So where here, so you have two regions. There is this region you see here where uh, U is positive and where U is positive, uh, the obstacle plays no role. So if it plays no role, the Laplacian of U there should be equal to one because this should be like in the free case. So before I told you if there is no obstacle, the Laplacian is identically equal to one. But now, of course, we have to distinguish in the two regions, the region where U is positive and the region where U is zero. So where U is positive, the Laplacian is one. And where U is zero, well, U is zero. Not much to say. Well, in fact, you have to be careful because you still need to say exactly here what happens at the, at the free boundary. So there, there is a small work to be done. But let's say that uh, um, this has been done and I tell you what are the optimal condition. I write this in this way. Laplacian of U is the characteristics of the set U positive. Okay, where the characteristic function of a set, I remind you is the function which is one if X is in the set and zero if X is not in the set, okay? So um, this does exactly what we want because you see when U is positive, the characteristic function will be one. And then um, uh, the characteristic function one is exactly what we, so Laplacian one is what we expect. But here it says a bit more. So here you see it says that the Laplacian of U is also a bounded function is in L infinity because the characteristic function of a set is trivially L infinity. It's bounded between zero and one. So from that, you get some extra conditions that I will come back to it. But okay, so here are the optimality conditions. So the optimality condition for our function U is that it is non-negative and it satisfies the Laplacian to be equal to the characteristic of U positive. And now comes all the work. So we found the minimizer. It is unique, that's easy to prove. And we have now two main questions. So question one, how smooth is U? Question two, how smooth is the boundary of U positive? Okay. So uh, these are the, the natural questions we want to address. So about question one, we can give immediately an answer. So already in the 1960s, this has been studied and solved. And uh, the situation is the following. So you can see that, um, so the Laplacian of U is the trace of the action of U. And uh, I told you that this is bounded. So this is L infinity, okay? On the other end, uh, the Laplacian of U is not continuous, okay? Why? Because let me draw now a picture from the top. This is, let's say, my set omega. And then I will have maybe my contact region here. This is where U is zero. And this is where U is positive. And the Laplacian jumps. Because, so the Laplacian of my function, so Laplacian of U is one here, and the Laplacian of U is zero here. Okay, so it jumps between zero and one. So it's discontinuous. So in particular, this implies that U cannot be C2, okay? So C2 regularity is forbidden. Perfect. And then the theorem is that U is C11, which means that the Hessian exists in the sense of distributions and is an L infinity function, okay? And this is optimal. By the consideration I just made about the Laplacian, so it cannot be C two, and in fact it's C one one. So the what, uh, excuse me for what kinds of obstacles is that true? Uh, um, this is essentially for every smooth obstacle. So okay. This has, mm -hmm. So the obstacle enters a bit in the right hand side. So here, um, of course, so if you didn't have uh, U equal zero, you would have a different Laplacian. So here the Laplacian would not be zero. So um, see here. I, here the Laplacian is zero because um, uh, U is zero, the obstacle is zero. So if it was a different obstacle, the Laplacian would be equal to the Laplacian of the obstacle. Mm -hmm. And then you will get different values. But as, lot, as long as the Laplacian of the obstacle, um, so he, the theorem is that if the obstacle is C11, then the solution is C11. Okay, good. And, and yet the obstacle is you know, C infinity. 
So everything I will say in this theorem works, let's say for almost everything, I will, there is a small non-degenerate condition, but let's say up to one small, small technical point, uh, you can think that everything works for infinity obstacles because I will go to higher regularity very soon. And so it's good to think just smooth obstacle. Then one can also be more precise. Um, okay, so this answer question one, good. Now we want to enter question two. This is really the goal, okay? So the first, I would say, very important answer to this uh, question two, so how smooth is the free boundary? The free boundary, um, okay, I didn't say, but this, this uh, boundary of uh, U positive, right? Um, so it's a free boundary because it's the boundary of a set, but it's not a, a boundary that we are prescribing from the problem. It's not the boundary of omega, where omega is assigned. It's part of the problem itself. That's why we call it a free boundary, okay? So it's, uh, it's free to do what it wants, more or less. And the girl is, can we, can we say something about its regularity? Um, so in the, in the 70s, more precisely in 77, Kinderlehrer and Nirenberg proved the following theorem. They proved um, a sort of theorem that tells you if the free boundary is C1, then it's infinity. And let me explain what they mean by this. So what they prove is the following. Let's assume that I have a ball, okay? Let's say that the origin of this ball is, uh, is a free boundary point. And let me assume that the free boundary passed through the center of this ball, okay? So this is the free boundary. And let me assume that uh, here U is positive, while here U is zero. Okay, so there is an upper surface. So the free boundary is an upper surface that, you know, passed, passed through the center of a, on a, of a certain ball, uh, BR, let me call this ball BR. And half of the ball is where U is positive and half of the ball is where U is uh, zero, okay? Well, half, I mean, um, there is one side and one side, okay? And so the assumption is that this is a C1 upper surface. So, uh, so boundary of U positive is C1 in BR. So this is my assumption. Then boundary of U positive is C infinity. In fact, analytic, but let's say C infinity in BR over two, okay? So if my free boundary is a nice surface that cuts in two parts, uh, the U positive from U zero, then uh, you have a sort of uh, bootstrap, a sort of regularity uh, theory that tells you once you are C1, you go on, you iterate and you get all the way to infinity. okay? So this is the theorem. And uh, however, it's a conditional theorem. It tells you if you are in this situation where you have this nice surface cutting in two, then you are C infinity. And then the question is, when does this happen? And uh, so uh, the breakthrough happened, in fact, at the same moment. Um, and this is uh, Caffarelli's uh, result in 77, where he proved the following. So theorem, the free boundary can be written as a union of two pieces, a regular part and a singular part, okay? What is the regular part? So the regular parts are points as in Kinderler Nirenberg. So the regular part is made of all the points where Kinderler and Nirenberg theorem applies. Okay. And then there is a rest. And these are my singular points. And, and now the question is how do they look like? So what is the complement of the points where I cannot apply this theorem by Kinderler and Nirenberg? And these points are the points where the following happens. So zero. Let me write it here. So zero, let's say that zero is on the free boundary and zero is a singular point. Then for every R positive, there exists a vector ER on the sphere such that uh, the following goals. So I can write in BR, I look at my free boundary in BR 
And then I have a vector ER here on the sphere. I take the upper plane orthogonal to ER. And then I take, so this is my BR. So this is R, this is BR. And then I take a small neighborhood of it. So this is a little of our neighborhood of it. And my free boundary, so let's say my contact region, for instance, U equals zero is trapped here. So this is all this region I'm coloring here, this is U equals zero. Instead here, U is positive and here U is positive, okay? So what Caffarelli proved is that if you are singular, which means you are not of the type, a point where you can apply Kinder and Nirenberg, in fact, you are very special. So many points should, have, at many points, Kinder and Nirenberg should apply because in the complement, you must be a point where you see uh, the, 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 the region U equals zero is extremely, extremely thin there. So in fact, U is mostly positive, okay? Which, is, which are like the points where the, my, my obstacle is just grazing above the obstacle. So, uh, sorry, my, my lasting membrane is only grazing. So, the regular points are the points where really my obstacle, my lasting membrane touches the obstacle and there is some real contact set. So, they really touch. There is one, one half of the points, half of the region where I'm positive and half where I'm zero, let's say, more or less. And the complement, these singular points are points that when I look around them, I'm essentially only grazing the obstacle. So let me try to give you an example to maybe uh, explain this. So an example could be the following. My domain omega uh, could be this. So this is my omega. And now this is my contact region. So u equals zero could be this. So this is the region u equals zero. Here u is positive. And now you see, uh, let's say, let me try to highlight maybe. These, these points here are uh, the singular points. And uh, I don't know, maybe these points here. are the regular points. Okay, so in this case, you see I have these two drops in the plane. And then you see that the most points, if I zoom, maybe I will just zoom for clarity. So if I take any point here, you see I have a small ball where I see a bit of U equals zero and in the complement U is positive. Instead, if I take any point here, let's say, and I zoom, you see most of the, in most points U is zero, and then there is a very small region where, sorry, in most points U is positive, and there is a very small region where U is zero. So these are my singular points, okay? So this is the kind of situation, and what I would like to emphasize in this picture, this is very interesting, the regular set is the union of two curves, two smooth curves, and the singular set here is a segment, or let's say a curve, one single curve. So in this picture, they're both 1D sets. They're both curves. So it's not, we're not in a situation where the singular points are small compared to the regular points. They have the same size, okay? The free boundary in the plane is one dimensional, and then the regular points are the you know, two dimension of two curves. And the singular set is one curve. So they're all the same size. That's, that's what it is. OK. So um, the regular set, I told you, is very nice. In fact, it's a nice infinity upper surface um, by, by Kinderler and Nirenberg. Actually, it's analytic, if you want. Um, so the real question is, what can I say about Sing? So the only thing Caffarelli proved in 77 is just that around each singular point, I have this kind of picture where, as I zoom in, uh, I see uh, this kind of picture. And in particular, 
for those who are a bit uh, familiar with this question in, for instance, geometric measure theory, the, you can notice that here there is this vector ER. So this ER determines the direction of the hyperplane. And a priori, this vector could depend on R. So in 77, Caffarelli could not say that my free boundary is getting closer and closer to a single hyperplane. So uh, what Caffarelli said in, uh, in 77 here by finding this vector ER was just that at scale R, there is an hyperplane such that my free boundary is very close to it. But as I change scale, a priori this direction can change. So this was the situation in 77. So then you know, research went on. There have been many works. So uh, now the question is study the singular set. So an important contribution is done by Caffarelli again. And uh, there have been works between 77, further works, but let's say the conclusive work was in 98. And then in 98, he proved, Caffarelli proved that ER is actually equal to E, so is independent of R. Independent of R. So you have really have a, at each scale, you have a plane and the plane is always the same. And this is very important. And as a consequence of this, he proved the following theorem that the singular set is contained in a C1 n minus one dimensional uh, surface. Okay. So the I told you the regular set is a C infinity n minus one dimensional surface. And then what Caffarelli proved is that it's contained a C1 and minus one dimensional surface, this single set. So let's try to analyze. There are here two points that I would like to analyze. So there is the containment here. So seeing is contained. And then there is the C1 regularity, okay? There are two, two steps. So let's discuss a moment the containment, the fact that seeing is contained. Okay, so the fact that thing is contained is optimal, and the reason is the following. In the plane, I could do a construction like this. I could take a line, okay? And then I do the following game that probably you already know, where you have a, a segment zero one, and then you take one thirds, two thirds. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna draw a very smooth line here, up and down that you know arrives here tangent at these points. And I declare that here u is zero. Then I will split uh, this interval again. And then I will repeat here a very small, let me zoom in. Ta -ta -ta. Again here. And here again, I will declare u is zero. And I will iterate this, okay? As you can imagine. Tuck, well, tuck, and so on. And if you do this, what happens? So every point here, so if I take a point here on the boundary, this point will be a regular point. But um, if instead I take it here at the, at the end, this will be a singular point. So in this example, sing is equal to the counter one third set. So you can build an example and then, okay, you, this is just the, how I define u equals zero, then I have to prove that I can extend you to be a solution to the obstacle problem, but there is kind of a construction uh, that is possible to be done. Um, so you can prove that there exists an example of a solution to the obstacle problem um, when the with smooth obstacle, infinity obstacle, such that thing is counter one third, okay? Which it's contained in a line. So it's contained in a very smooth set. It's contained in a C infinity one dimensional surface, but the singular set itself is not a manifold, okay? The singular set is really just a very rough set. So this is just to say that the, the fact that the thing is contained, it's optimal. You cannot say that the singular set is smooth. It's just containing something nice. So this is the first thing. And so the containment is, is, um, is what it is. 
So then the, the next question you could ask is that, okay, what about now the C11 regularity that Caffarelli stated, okay? Sorry, the C1 regularity. So there has been many progress there. I will not cite all the intermediate steps, but let me mention a result uh, of uh, myself and Joachim Serra in, in 2019, where we proved that SING is C11, so it's better than C1 and it has almost one derivative more, so uh, up to a codimension tree set. So, and this is optimal. So if you don't remove a codimension tree set, in fact, the singular set is at most C1. So you can build an example in three dimension where the singular set is really only at most C1. Um, but uh, if you are allowed for, to remove some codimension tree set, then in reality, you can do, you can pass to C11. And then you could say, okay, but is really C11 what, what is needed? I mean, how optimal it is? Well, in reality, we went on um, to an analyze that. I think here is where is the paper where we kind of understood how to push forward regularity. So uh, for those who are familiar, I will not enter here, but uh, we introduced the angular frequency formula in these kind of problems, which uh, was actually something unexpected to, to, to be seen. And then through that and through um, kind of GMT analysis, we managed to prove this result. And then there has been works, uh, further works by myself, uh, Rossoton and Serra first, and then by Franceschini, Franceschini and Zaton, Franceschini, oh, sorry, Franceschini and Zaton, let's say roughly 22. Uh, they are, I mean, they were both students here in Zurich. And uh, now the final theorem we know is that SING is contained in a C infinity uh, upper surface up to codimension two. And this is again uh, optimal. So you need, uh, so if you want to go to C11, you can remove a codimension three set, but if you want to go higher regularity, you have to throw away more set. Yeah, to, to remove more set, throw away more, more points. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about the regularity of the singular set. And now let's move to genericity because that's really what we want to say. So we, we believe that gene generically things should be better. So there is a conjecture dating to 74, and this is due to Schaeffer, who said the following, generically, Sing equal empty set. So con Jeffer in 74 conjecture that in fact, the examples I mentioned to you, like with this counter set, or in particular this example where the, I had the, you know, the two drops and a segment connecting them, they are unstable. So it's examples you can build, but as I perturb a bit my boundary data, I shouldn't see them, okay? That's a very uh, reasonable conjecture. In fact, this was proved uh, for n equal to by Mono in 2003. So um, now I would like to state what we did and explain you what, a bit what we did. And to explain that, let me first des decide what is generic. So Schaeffer didn't say exactly what generic meant. So I will give you our definition of generic. So what we do is the following. We have our, our obstacle problem, right? Where you have uh, some wire here, F, and then our solution, U. Okay. And then we are gonna embed this single problem into a one dimensional family of problems by considering a family of data, a family of curves, FT, which will have some solution um, well, it's difficult to draw here, I must say, ut, 
So what we do is the following. We, we, we consider let ft, so t is not time, but it's just a parameter between minus one and one, be a monotone, let's say, for instance, dtft positive, family of functions such that f0 equal f. Okay, so we embed our problem in a one-dimensional family of problems where we take our boundary data to be mono. And then we solve Laplacian of ut. So the ut is not a time derivative, it's just a subscript here, Car equal characteristic of ut positive. Uh, ut is non negative. And then uh, ut on the boundary of omega is equal to ft. Okay, and uh, here, you, by maximum principle, you can prove that uh, ft less than fs implies ut less or equal than us. So because the boundary data are, are ordered, the solution will be ordered, because this problem has a maximum principle. So you have uh, this one parameter family of solutions who are polyating the space, okay, as, they move, as you move them up and down. And now the kind of conjecture you could expect is that, so, in the Sheffer spirit could be, okay, for almost every T, uh, the single set should be empty. This would be Sheffer conjecture in our formulation. Uh, I'm not sure it's true, to be honest. Actually, that would be too optimistic. And um, I wouldn't even, to be honest, I, I'm not even sure I believe that. But I can tell you what we can prove. And that, so this is our theorem. Uh, again, uh, myself, Rossoton, and then uh, Serra. This was done in 2020. And this for almost every T, the singular set of UT, so sing of UT, so the solution, as HN minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure equal zero. So in particular, Schaeffer holds. for n less or equal than four. Because if you are in n less or equal than four, uh, chain minus one counts points. And so saying that means it's empty. Okay. So uh, this is what we proved. So we got the Schaeffer conjecture, but in fact, we got a result in every dimension that tells you that the singular set generically is much smaller than the regular set. So you have this free boundary, which is an n minus one dimensional set. And then within this n minus one dimensional set, there is a set which is less than n minus four dimensional, and this is the singular set, okay? Um, maybe now I still have a few minutes, so just some comments on, sorry, on the word, uh, on the kind of proof. Um, so I would say the intuition for me um, comes from Sartre theorem. That's where uh, intuition comes. So let me try to explain this. Maybe first I will do a three-dimensional proof a three-dimensional picture, and then I will try. So this is T, and this is my X in R2. Let me start to draw for you uh, this, the, the zero set of U. So here, this is, let's say, uh, U minus one equals zero, okay? So this corresponds, so this will be contained in T equal minus one. So this is T equal minus one. I'm not very good in these pictures. And then I, I draw for each t the different um, s3 increases. So as the, 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 the third, the, let's say the z axis go up, I will draw my zero sets. So th this is the contact set of u minus one. And then as I go up with t, let's say, I will get the contact set. This is, I don't know, uh, u zero equals zero, then maybe uh, u one half equals zero. And then maybe u1 equals zero is this. So as I go up, the contact set shrinks because I'm lifting the solution. So I have less contact set. And then let me try to draw this as a graph. Well, it stops here. Okay. Makes, I hope it makes sense. So I'm drawing this as a graph. So this is just the union as I move one up, as I like, uh, I'm putting one above the others, my contact set where the, the height is this parameter T. 
So this is a, like a shrinking set. So let me redo this picture, but, but in one dimension less, because then it's easier to see. So I have XFT, let's say the contact set um, for zero is here. <clears throat> the contact set before minus one is here, and then it goes up. It does this and it does this. Okay, it's not very rich, the picture into, in one dimension, but I hope you understand. And in this picture, look, the moment where things happen, like singular points up there are the points like this. So let me draw it up. So this is the contact set at some special time, T star. So this will be like U T star equal zero. And this corresponds in this picture to this point. So this is a singular point for U T star. And essentially singular points corresponds to points where this graph that I'm drawing, it's flat. So these are my sing this is a singular point. This one, here I only have one singular point in reality, but in general, I have this, this kind of graph in uh, Rn with values in R, and all the critical points are the points that correspond to the singular set. So you see, this is a critical point for this graph. If you think of this as a graph of a function, this function, this is a critical point. And now, here you see this is a critical value. Okay. And uh, so what I'm asking, so I have this function that I draw and then uh, I look at the, so if uh, there is no, so if this point for instance is here, is different from a critical value, let's say I take this T, here you see I have no singular points and these are the points where Sheffer conjecture holds. So the, the, the bad points, so, Sing of ut star of ut, let's say, sing of ut is non empty if and only if um, t, so let's say there is no point that exists, doesn't exist x and t on the free boundary of, um, or maybe I could write in this way, that doesn't exist x on the free boundary of ut. So x in the free boundary of ut, where um, x is a critical point for the graph above. OK, so this is my function. The function is the one that represents the, the this union of uh, the free boundaries that I did by lifting up. And, uh, and then uh, the question is for which dimension the set, so the question becomes, I want that the, the measure, the, the H1 measure of the critical values is zero. Is zero. So when is this true? Okay, so this is about the regularity of this. So, okay, in 1D, there is not much to say, but the measure of the critical values is linked to the behavior of the function around critical points. So in, uh, in sub theorem, for instance, you need like uh, the, the higher the, the, the bottom, so the higher here, if you're in a REN, the higher is N, the higher the regularity you need for sub theorem to apply. Okay, because it's linked to this to covering arguments, Morse lemma. I don't know how you how you prove it, but there are many ways to prove Sartian. And this is what we want to do in our setting. So we want to understand the behavior here of this graph. So here is the region where we want to understand. So we need to understand how free boundary, the free boundary moves. So here this graph represents this, how the free boundary changes in T. And so we need to understand how the free boundary moves in time to understand its regularity, and so whether we can apply SAR theorem or not, essentially, that's the goal. And um, here, there is a lot of uh, stratification. So we are going to take like the set of all singular points. So singulars uh, for ut. We have this uncountable union of them. And then we need to, to split them in many sets. There will be a set uh, sigma infinity, which is very good, another set, another set, blah, blah, blah. And now some sets are where 
let's say SARD works well. And then some sets will be points where, so SARDs work well means my function is very, very flat. So the projection of the critical value is extremely flat. And then there are some points where SARD works less well, but this set is small. So you know, SARD is a, there is total balance, is regularity of the function plus the, the size of the set where, that you look in, this, in the starting point. So you have the, the domain and the codomain. You have the domain, you have a function which has some regularity and you look at its image in the codomain. And there is a trade-off, the size of the domain versus the regularity of the function. So you are, you are able to give up some regularity provided the domain where you look at your function is small. And that's what we have to do. We have to stratify our singular set in many pieces. In some pieces, SARS works extremely well. In other pieces, SARS doesn't work very well, but then it, the set is small, and then you need to do all the numerology, and that's how you, we get our result. And I think I'm on time now, 45 plus epsilon minutes, so I stop here. Thank you.